Our next speaker is going to look at a slightly different aspect of it. Um, he's Richard Harlow. Um, he's now the currently, or has been the manager and administrator of the Michigan Farmland and Open Space Preservation Department of the Michigan um, Department of Agriculture. He's been a planner for over tw um, so in both Michigan and Ohio for 17 years. He has his MA in Bowling Green um, State University and graduate work at Michigan State University. Um, I think it's very interesting that he's teaching as an adjunct in a couple of classes. I thought you'd be interested to know what they are. Um, he's teaching geography um, at Lansing Community College, and one of the things that's interesting development, I think, in academia is that geography has moved from being what you did in fifth grade to a major um, academic enterprise. Um, and one of the, I think, most interesting development legal um, scholarship is looking at law and geography in various contexts. But he's also doing a course at Michigan State on global diversity and interdependence, um, which I think is also very interesting. So we're delighted to have Richard join us. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be speaking uh, for Brad today. He had an unavoidable family conflict and asked me to speak uh, today for him. Uh, I should point out that one of the uh, uh, great pleasures recently for me is to have been working with uh, the uh, planning department for the city of Detroit with their urban agricultural work group, which is a group of folks that are involved in agriculture in, in, uh, in the city. We began in January uh, after some changes were made to a uh, portion of the right to farm gaps to work with the city in developing zoning ordinances relative to um, uh, permitting, allowing, uh, encouraging agriculture in the city. I've been meeting uh, up until the latter part of April every, every other week and it's been a great pleasure to interact with uh, the folks of a bunch of dedicated people who are interested in preserving keeping agriculture viable within the city. And so it's uh, been a neat experience. We continue to have that relationship uh, with the city planning office and hope to review some uh, zoning amendments that they're intending to have relative to urban agriculture here in Detroit. Uh, my plan today is to use uh, Brad's uh, slides that he had and to discuss a little bit about what uh, the Department of Agriculture and Rural Development's role is in um, uh, working with cities relative to agriculture and there are a number of regulations that we deal with and certainly one that's come up is right to farm. Um, others we'll talk about here just briefly. So I'll, if you have questions, by the way, um, I don't know if it's acceptable to have them during the course of the presentation, that's fine with me if you wish to do that. So if something uh, I'm saying up here gets your uh, ire, stop me and we'll be happy to talk about it. Uh, just to give you an idea of Michigan and what our particular department does uh, and the impact of agriculture in the state currently, it's the second most important uh, industry within, within the state, uh, second certainly to manufacturing. We go in a kind of a tug of war with tourism, um, uh, back and forth, whether they are the, the, the second or not, but we, we, are, we believe we're their second. $91.4 billion worth of, of uh, impact on the economy. Some is gross receipts from the agricultural operations themselves. Other involve processing uh, and uh, food distribution within the state. So it's a relatively large economic driver. Uh, about 73,000 farmers in Michigan. And food sector represents about 22% of the employment within the state when you take in both uh, agricultural operations as well as the processing and uh, other activities associated with agriculture in Michigan. Uh, one estimate I'd seen was about a million employee, employees associated with agriculture in the state. And I did neglect to mention, uh, not only have I been attending these meetings with the Urban Agriculture Work Group, Bridget Patrick from our office, who's sitting here, if you can give us one of those, has also been coming uh, to those meetings as well. So if you have questions about that, uh, uh, that interaction that's in state's role in that, Bridget would be happy to uh, share with you as well. So this is basically a relatively large industry in the state. Um, and some of the things we do, this is not all of them. These are some of the activities that we have. Environmental protection, so we deal with uh, use of pesticides, fertilizers, composting. Um, we have a specialist within the department who is uh, uh, Dr. Buck Whites, who deals with uh, soil testing. So we can talk a little bit about that later on in this presentation. 
um, livestock and animal care, both animal health as well as the siting of uh, livestock facilities uh, within both urban and, and rural areas. Um, and that ties back into that right to farm, some of those right to farm questions you've had. And we'll get into that in some more detail. Food safety, is the food that you're eating safe? Are you gonna get salmonella from something? Or is there something in the lettuce? You know, our department does the inspections relative to those particular activities. And we'll talk a little bit about cottage foods laws, which actually sort of morphs into what's going on with urban agriculture in the state as well as an opportunity for uh, small scale producers to be able to produce products and sell them um, from their particular agricultural operations. Uh, consumer protection, uh, we get involved in a whole bunch of different things when it weights and measures, we'll talk about uh, that particular uh, portion of the program. And then we have an economic development arm that's associated with the department and some recent uh, budget proposals that uh, are in the governor's budget proposal relative to um, uh, urban hubs for agricultural distribution of materials. And so, so these are some of the roles that we play. There's a number of others, but these are the ones that primarily relate to uh, what happens within the department and urban agriculture. Talking a bit about pe pesticides, uh, one of the eye openers going to um, uh, working with the Urban Agricultural Work Group with the City of Detroit was that um, there were a variety, uh, as you'd expect, and I appreciate the first presenter's comments about a whole variety of ways that people have perspectives on how you do things. One of the, one of the perspectives was we, do, we do not want to be able to, we don't want to, we want to ban pesticide use within the City of Detroit. Makes sense to folks that that would be a, we want to ban them. And so, Part of our mission in the department, uh, there were several, one of which was to talk about the pesticide law and whether you can actually do that within the, the current state statute, which it's not possible to ban them. Um, there's a provision that you can't expand on the pesticide, pesticide regulations and statutes in terms of either reducing them or making them more restrictive. Uh, so it's not possible to do that. And then would you really want to do that? You know, do you want to have some folks like to have you know, True Green or Chemlon or somebody else do something with their lawn that's regulated under this particular statute. Uh, a whole bunch of things that you might not suspect would be pesticides would be regulated under the statute that you currently use. So, so anyway, there was a really good discussion and, and feedback and back and forth about that, which was po very positive. So some of the things that happened that were uh, uh, we explained within, within this pesticide regulation was that if you're going to be applying pesticides, so those lawn companies that do that, or if you have a commercial agricultural operation and you're using pesticides, you typically have to be a certified applicator to do that. And there's a process you go through, educational training, receive certification from the department in order to apply those pesticides. And there's two levels of pesticides that are applied. One would be pesticides that are, um, that you might do uh, with your home garden. And those are, would not require a certification. Um, there's others that are done on farms that uh, you would do that's a normal kind of pesticide, but there's another one which is called a restricted use pesticide. Higher quantities of pesticides rather than being diluted that you might find in your own personal applications that you have to be certified to apply those. And that's oftentimes on large scale farms. So there's a certification process built within the department to uh, track what's happening and make sure that you're doing it properly when that happens. One of the key things for everybody, uh, you and I, if we're using pesticides or if they're being used uh, by a farmer, is read the label. Do what it says you're supposed to do on the label relative to use, disposal, um, personal protective equipment, those sorts of things when you're using it. I have, I have a garden myself, go to the Lowe's and pick up a bottle of seven, you look on the back and it's a book on this, stuck on the back of this is the stuff you have to read, so, and, and there's a lot of restrictions associated with that. Follow the label, those things will work you through the process. So that's part of what we deal with in the, uh, with our pesticide program. There's a staff that deals with that. There are federal re regulations relative to uh, uh, pesticide use, label uh, specific information, how do you use it, do you wear a mask, those sorts of things. Uh, are you gonna post it so if you have your lawn done, uh, with uh, one of those companies, you'll see a small, typically white placard about this point that they stick in your lawn and say, don't walk on the lawn or let your pets run on the lawn for the next hour or 24 hours, depending on what was put on the lawn. That's required by state statute. And so those kind of notifications are present. 
can't enter the property after a certain point in time. Uh, they have to be on commercial farm operations, decontamination facilities in case there's an accident associated with the, that pesticide, record keeping, and then uh, documents associated with a medical emergency response. So there's quite a bit of documentation associated with that. How do you handle pesticides um, and worker protection as well? Um, one of the big issues associated with pesticides is, there's two of them actually, is off-target spraying and off-target drift, both of which are regulated by statute. Uh, and you can control that. You have to be smart about, particularly if you're commercial agricultural operation, what do you consider? What's the weather like? Gee, is it going to be 20 mile an hour per wind? Probably not a good, good time or a good idea to be spraying pesticides of that because you're going to have off uh, a drift associated with that. And certainly don't spray it on somebody else's property, which is another thing that uh, can happen. Droplet size. I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues you would look at here that uh, are associated with that. What are the buffer zones or setbacks? We have farmers now that are actually installing wooded barriers if there's a use adjacent to that they don't want drift to, to occur that would help stop the drift associated with what they're doing. And you have to have drift management plans if you're a farmer. And so those are things that are uh, very prominent associated with pesticide use that oftentimes uh, people are fear fearful about that. Um, Food safety we deal with relative to when the pesticides are sprayed, what's on a particular uh, uh, fruit, for example. You know, Michigan has is the second most diverse agricultural production um, in, the, in the nation, second only to California. So we do a lot of different, uh, uh, different types of fruits and vegetables and other crops produced here. Um, issues related to, again, drift, how you use pesticides indoors. The bottom line, the last, the last line here, if there's a pesticide misuse complaint, that's the department's hotline. You call up that number, the department comes out and investigates the complaint anywhere in the state of Michigan, urban areas, rural areas. They'll come out and investigate the complaint and uh, work for resolution if there is an issue associated with it. So knowing that, for me, it gives me a, a certain sense of, uh, uh, I know peace is probably the wrong term to use, but at least knowing that that is available for anyone who's using pesticides and maybe using them incorrectly, there's a number to call and someone will be there. We have field offices without, within the state, that will happen. So uh, I think we have uh, just some issues associated with pesticides and fertilizers. Uh, one of the issues with putting together a local zoning ordinance, I think we kind of ran into, uh, is there's perceptions, there's the scientific perspective on what pesticides, what is the appropriate use of pesticides and what isn't, and uh, are the regulations based on that? Are they based on perhaps a perception of the social uh, concept of pesticides are bad? Gee, we watched Food Inc. or some other uh, program relative to improper use of chemicals on occasion. And so um, when putting together local zoning ordinances relative to this, you kind of have to take in both, both factors. And so one of the discussion points with the city of Detroit, there's a way to expand on our pesticide laws and regulations if it's approved by the Commission of Agriculture. And so the discussion, well, what kind of things might they approve? Gee, it's probably not appropriate to do aerial spraying in Detroit. You all agree with that? Makes sense? Good idea. Another one was notification. There's notification requirements for adjacent landowners if you're using pesticides and your commercial operator. There was some discussion about perhaps the city of Detroit submitting documentation that would argue for a similar notification for smaller scale operations, which makes some sense. So I think there is that opportunity here to expand on that, assuming there's some basis, scientific basis for that. Um, storage of pesticides regulated by the, the, the state and the use and storage and application of organic related pesticides also regulated by the state. So just to let you know that those things are there. When you talk about expanding, um, the process for that is going through the Agriculture Commission? So the question is if uh, you wanted to expand the state statute or the four rules that are associated with uh, pesticide use, uh, you would go to the Commission of Agriculture to do that. You'd submit a, a document with supporting documentation saying this is why we want to do this in your particular local community. Thanks for the question. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. That's, is that, I mean, 
seems like that's sort of a variation on the right to farm zoning issues. I mean, you're, you're saying, you know, when the farm comes back to the city, how these regulations will fit in the urban environment. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a, it's a similar sort of situation with right to farm. If you wanted to write zoning ordinances that were, so, so two approaches with right to farm, which we'll get to. Um, one is to continue to have right to farm, have a, uh, have a role to play within your community. And if you wanted to expand on the GAMPs, the generally accepted agricultural management practices, you could petition the uh, Commission of Agriculture to approve that if you had a uh, reason for doing that. So, good question. Anything else on pesticides? Moving on from that. Okay. Uh, we also regulate regulate fertilizer use. Uh, one of the again may sound crazy to even say this, but it's in statute. Don't apply fertilizer to impervious services. I, it's kind of a crazy thing, but yeah, that seems to make sense. You don't want it to concentrate and drain off into some particular place where it might cause some major issues. Changes in the application of phosphorus now, recent law that was passed that uh, limits the amount of phosphorus that can be placed on uh, golf courses, turf grass, those sorts of things, so that it's, it's restricted um, major uh, cause of eutrophication in, in water bodies and that sort of thing with the amount of phosphorus. So recent, recently passed, I think it was in 2010, to restrict that. Um, just so you know, the middle number in the three numbers that you find, you, you probably know this, is the phosphate. Um, and looking at what you're applying um, would be an important uh, process. And certainly security, we're all familiar with the Oklahoma bombing, which was basically agricultural fertilizer and diesel fuel. And so that is strictly re regulated by the state of Michigan now in terms of who has uh, nitrogen fertilizer, where is it located, and how much do they have? Just to let you know that that occurs through our department. So, uh, composting, big discussion issue with uh, the Urban Agriculture Work Group. How do you do the thing? I mean, how big should it be? What sort of things should be in it? Uh, you can have backyard composting, agricultural composting, which would be in a larger scale operation, and then uh, commercial composting facilities where that's what you do. People bring leaf, uh, leaves and grass clippings and put it on your parcel and then you compost it and then you sell off the compost at some point in the future. So uh, commercial composting regulated by the Department of, uh, Department, of, uh, uh, Department of Environmental Quality. There you go, DEQ, used to using acronyms, sorry about that. I can have a whole conversation with you in acronyms if you'd like that, would that, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I won't do that. But I and uh, Bridget is our public uh, information officer. She said I should actually tell a brief humor story here. Are you up for that, real quick? So, I true story. I was in in San Diego walking down the street and I saw this sign and it said brain transplants. And so I went in and we don't have those in Michigan. I said, what kind do you have? And they said, well, we have the brains of attorneys. I said, how much are those? And they said, well, those are five hundred dollars. I said any professors at law schools? They said, sure, we have those, and how much? Are there $600? I said, well, I'm a state employee. You have any state employee range? They said, sure, why don't you come back to this room, especially humidity controlled, refrigerated. Uh, oops, opens up this big door, getting into this joke too much. Opens up this big door, takes a large jar off the top, says, this is our state employee brain. So how much is that? That's well, $5,000. Wow, great, how come it's so expensive? He says, do you have any idea how many state employees it takes just to get one of these? <laughs> Sorry, Bridget, and any other state employees that are... Yes, you like the, you like the joke? I was, I was holding up to the honor of Lara. <laughs> oh, thank you. So you're a state employee. Sorry, I should have scanned the room beforehand. At any rate, so some of the issues we, uh, we talked about with the Urban Agriculture Work Group were... Um, some of the things you wouldn't want to have in your compost pile, you know, odors, leachate, and pests. And so uh, regulations that uh, were talked about in terms of looking at was restricting what you could put in your compost pile. Uh, and, you know, not putting, putting some food waste, but certain things not in there because they're going to attract raccoons and rats and some other things you don't want to have uh, concentrated within your particular area. So I think that, that there was a positive approach to that. The other side to restricting those sorts of things, if you're putting together an urban, uh, urban ordinance, is enforcement. Do you have the, the bodies to enforce the particular 
you know, going out and looking in people's compost piles and that sort of thing. So keep that in mind if you're going to be developing some of these things. Moving on past composting. Anything on composting? Okay. Uh, we can do that. Soil contamination, I think there was a question earlier about soil com contamination. I mentioned we have a gentleman in our office who uh, deals with that, uh, a scientist, so which is a, a great thing. Um, and he has this list of things you should check for. What's a previous use? Why would that matter? But it matters, okay? Uh, perform sampling, you know, get the soil tests, and there are places where you can get the soil testing done, one of which, which would be at Michigan State University. Interpret the results, what have you got? Uh, manage the risks, and there's interesting ways to do that uh, in an urban setting. And then you begin farming if, you can, if you've gone through this and you feel comfortable doing the situation. The thing I want to you know, caution you with, uh, most folks that are growing their gardens in their backyard are probably have, and it's been a house, a residential setting, probably don't have an issue with soil contamination necessarily. Um, the places where there may be more issues if it was an old urban or an old industrial site and something of that nature. So, but anyway, so this is uh, what he recommends that we do. A um, couple of three tables here. I think we can make this all available to you at some particular point, but you're doing the, the past history. Go into the Detroit's records and see what was here before on this particular piece of ground. Uh, you know, if it's agricultural, those are the kind of things you'd look for. Uh, if it was a car wash, yeah, uh, you're going to have metals, you're going to have, uh, let's see here, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that's what the PA is, um, dry cleaning, solvent. So you, you kind of get an idea, that's your first step, find out what the heck was there, uh, and that gives you a, a, an inroad into what you might even be testing for when you get the soil sample put together. Residential areas and buildings. You know, lead-based paints, and so a big issue is lead-based paints. And so the discussion in the urban agriculture work group, which was a, quite a good one, was, okay, that's probably something you should be checking for. You're going to check for those particular things. Um, would it be wise to put backyard chickens and have them free range in your backyard if you're in a site that may have lead contamination? Probably not. You may want to keep them in a coop. Don't let them walk around and peck at the ground, those sorts of things. Just minor things to consider, but important. Another more list here, but again, looking at what was there first and kind of reviewing that as you go along. Um, so some of the things you can do if you have uh, uh, an issue. So let's say you test and you find that you have lead in your soil. It's probably good to do one of two things. Remove the dirt, put new dirt in. Does it make sense? Sure. Remove the dirt, put new dirt in. The other thing that you might want to do is put raised beds in. Okay, put new dirt in that, leave the dirt that's below there, and be careful what you plant in it. Okay, so there's a bunch of crops that are shown here, um, like say radishes and probably rutabagas and perhaps carrots that are located there. If you've got soil contamination, probably not a good idea to plant a root crop in that particular location. So these are kind of the things that we discussed, urban agriculture work group, if you're going to approach this. Uh, so use suitable crops, ones that may not have uptake of some of the, the uh, either he heavy metals or lead that's located there. Um, if you're doing some of that, food preparation is important. You know, certainly if you're doing root crops, peel the things before you eat them. Um, and then personal protection. Uh, one of the issues with lead, oddly enough, in soil is if you start doing something with the dirt, you're turning it over with a shovel and it's got lead con in content into it, you can inhale that, wear a mask. So those are some of the issues that we're, we kind of discussed within that particular group. But um, any questions on soil testing? Yes, sir. You were talking about uh, certain crops uptake where they'll take certain things out of the soil. I remember a few years ago there were some experiments going on in remediation using crops that do take things up out of the soil. Do you know what the, the latest status of that is? I, I don't, and I, it's, this is one of those instances where I don't know is probably going to come into play here. But um, I'd be happy to find that information out and get it to you if I can talk to you afterwards. So, okay. Certainly, with those particular crops, 
you're not, you know, what you do with him at the end of the hunt is also important. You know, you're going to feed him to people or animals or use them as biomass for ethanol production or something. So, good question. Can't answer it. Yes, sir. Uh, best case scenario, worst case scenario, best would be residential, worst would be industrial. Cost per acre for remediation, what numbers have you ever seen? Um, again, I don't know if I can give you a specific response. It would be certainly more expensive on an industrial site versus residential just because of the nature of the contaminants that you would expect to have there. Um, again, we can get you some numbers on that if uh, I don't know them off, off the top of my head. So, okay. so conclusions about soils. Uh, before deciding to develop land for gardening, agricultural activity, research its history. Explore options for testing, cleanup, or exposure, or management, and choose the right plants. So part of the documentation I think I can get for all of you if you wish to have that is from Dr. Buck White's about what plants might be the right ones to be placing in these particular locations, depending on the, the, what is located there. Okay. I apologize, I'm, I'm more of a, since I'm a geographer, planner, I'm a generalist, I know enough about these topics to be dangerous. Probably not enough to answer your questions real specifically. I probably shouldn't have divulged that until after the end of things, right? But I've been in the, anyway. So animal health and care. So the other issue that the department looks at is uh, animal health. Uh, are there any diseases that are going to be transmitted from animals to human beings? So one of the issues that the department is seriously looking at at this particular point in the city of Detroit is backyard chickens. You know, is there a disease that's associated with backyard chickens that could be transmitted uh, throughout the whole city that would result, I keep doing this, with that, with, throughout the whole city, with, which would result in the department having to come in and uh, do the quarantine and disease response, which would probably be likely collecting all the chickens and having them destroyed. Okay, so keeping track of that's important. Uh, biosecurity associated with that it ends up being important to you. You know, is it a wise idea if someone's raising chickens in their backyard and they may be diseased and you're raising chickens in your backyard uh, and you want to get one of their chickens and have it brought over to your chickens so that they, you know, you're doing that sort of situation. Oh, I, I don't need these chickens anymore, you can have mine. Not a smart thing to do. You may be transmitting disease from one location to the other. Those are issues that the department is, is uh, looking at uh, currently. We've got uh, actually retain some folks to work on this within the city of Detroit looking at uh, disease related uh, issues as well as soil related issues. If it's a contaminated site, this may not be the best place to have chickens free ranging outside. So it's currently in process with the department. Um, animal care issues, Brad wanted me to make sure that I said if there's a cruelty to animal issue, it's a local response, not the state of Michigan. We're not going to come out and um, take care of that particular issue. That's a, yes, sir. What's the buzz on beekeeping? Oh, the buzz on beekeeping. Very nice. I like that. Uh, um, well, uh, I could give you the discussion that we had in the urban agriculture work group, and then we have, we actually have an apiarist, I think that's the right term, with the uh, Department of Agriculture who would be happy to give you the buzz on beekeeping in more detail. But um, some of the discussion that happened in the urban agriculture work group was to, uh, gee, should there be setbacks? Should there be a setback from school sites? Should there be, um, uh, you know, uh, some sort of barrier so that they don't fly over? You know, all kinds of different discussions associated with that. And um, our apiarist said, you know, you may want to have them in school sites because they're an educational opportunity. And some folks from the urban agriculture work group said they were actually doing that. And so, um, there's a concern about um, Africanized honeybees, really not so much an issue in Michigan, but just because we're so far north and they don't winter over. You might get one year with a few, but they don't make it through the winter. Um, again, our apiarists would say they're great, locate them wherever you think they make sense to put them within the city. You might want to provide some setbacks. And oddly enough, one of the, one of the better places to put beehives would be on the top of multi-story buildings. So. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a, uh, yeah, it, it's, it was a big discussion issue with the group. Yes, sir. I want to follow up to his uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a city boy, so I really didn't know this until recently, but I, I know that bees, I know now that bees play a big, big role in agriculture in terms of pollination and things like that. 
and that there are actually out in California in Sacramento Valley people who drive around with beehives and get paid big bucks sure. to lease their bees to go into orchards and into crops and pollinate. Yeah, there's actually people in Michigan who do the same thing. I mean, they're, they're trucking around beehives for, for it makes sense if you've got an apple orchard on the west side of the state, you bring beehives in and get the pollination done. And it's, it's for Michigan, it's, um, you know, starts further, it would make sense, southern part of the state, uh, okay, now it's flowering, we need the bees, and they just move all the, up, the, up the west side of the state. So it's kind of a fascinating thing. Extremely important for, uh, you're, you're exactly right, for the plants that people are growing. And it would be important here, certainly in Detroit, for urban setting. Um, you know, the Africanized bee thing is more of a scare situation for people. It's really not something that, at least our apiarist thinks that it's, it's not going to happen here in the, in the state just because the, we freeze over. So, any other questions on those sorts of things? Uh, livestock and locations. This has right to farm in it, so I'll just skip over that slide. I'm just kidding. That was a joke, folks. I will go back to that. <laughs> Um, so the department through the GAMPs, so the Generally Accepted Agricultural Management Practices, these are practices that, as indicated by the first speaker, if you're using the GAMPs, you have some affirmative protection relative to nuisance lawsuits. The, the issue sometimes with folks is the name of the program, right to farm. That means I've got the right to farm, you know, zoning people, haha, -ha, you know, that sort of thing. Not, not the case, particularly with siting GAMPs, for example. So um, with the, for the department, there's a, under the Right to Farm Act, uh, there's a requirement for us to, we do three things with Right to Farm. One is to do, uh, if there's a complaint, we go investigate the complaint. We also can do determinations to determine if an existing site meets the GAMPs associated with a particular use. Um, and there's a third one, but those are the two that, that come to mind here. Uh, so the, the determination one is one that we've been running into in urban settings. Someone will have backyard chickens, okay? And they'll want the department to come in and say, these backyard chickens, uh, since they meet the right to farm GAMP, uh, right to farm, then they're permitted regardless of what the zoning is. Yeah, I don't know if you've ever heard that in your communities. Not the case. In the right to farm GAMP, it says uh, that if it's zoned a residential category, uh, you know, does not permit agricultural uses. If it's an area that does not permit agricultural uses, the right to farm gap relative to the animals, uh, the, the zoning is, is the one that uh, covers that. It's written right in the gap. Um, so if you're doing chickens in a backyard, we've got one city that we're dealing with, which will remain unnamed at this particular point. I think it's Voldemort, but a uh, little joke there. Anybody? No, okay. Um, Glad some of you got that. Cool. Uh, it's within a city nearby, and landowners got uh, about a, I think it's about a quarter of an acre of ground, 100 chickens, seven goats. Okay. I say a quarter of an acre, right? No, two sides of bees. Pardon me? Two sides and bees as well. Ah, okay. I only heard about the chickens and the, and the goats. I think the other ones were removed, but. Right to farm gamps, you have to have a 125 foot setback for anything from zero to 50. Doesn't meet the requirements. You have to be, uh, can't be more than a quarter of a mile away from other residential structures. Doesn't meet our siting gamps at all, plus the zoning code in that particular community doesn't permit goats. So it's like easy letter to write. Uh, yeah, we did a determination. You don't meet the requirements. Thank you uh, for a couple of reasons. So um, anyway, so siting GAMPs, the one that GAMP is not mentioned here, which is probably a, another one that's really critical, depending on what you might do in a local community, is manure management. If you have animals that are located, uh, you're allowing them, how are you going to handle the manure? Not so big a deal with a small scale backyard chicken, five chicken sort of thing. But if you get into larger operations, how do you manage the manure? That's protected under the Right to Farm program. Not protected, but it's covered by GAMPs, instructions on how to do that. So one of the things we, we've kind of found with working uh, towards zoning codes relative to urban agriculture is, uh, in some cases, utilizing the GAMP provisions relative to those things. Uh, in the case of the city of Detroit, discussion is oriented around 
basically the only kind of animals you might have in an agricultural operation uh, that would be outside would be chickens and rabbits. Okay, that would be the two things. Um, discussion about aquaculture, that would typically be in, in, in a building and that sort of thing. But so not allowing cattle operations because uh, you have to deal with a whole bunch of things, not the least of which is manure management. How do you handle that? Okay. Um, in, I think it was December of 2011. So, so the issue for the department relative to right to GAMP, or right to farm, excuse me, in the GAMPs was uh, clearly the city of Detroit uh, and other locations it was that felt that the right to farm program was in the way uh, in terms of doing local zoning ordinances, although a zoning ordinance could be done that would be submitted to the, the uh, state of Michigan that would the Commission of Agriculture would review. Um, so the, the approach was to modify the GAMPs. Every GAMP that we have, I think there's eight of them, would have a limitation that if you're a community of over 100,000 people, that you're not subject to the GAMPs. You have a GAMP exemption, which then allows you to write the ordinance that you may have. That being said, again, some of the material that's going into the zoning code, we believe, for the city of Detroit incorporates oftentimes some of the things that are located in the GAMPs, bee production and that sort of thing as well. I don't know if I should ask you this, but do you have any questions about GAMPs here at this particular point? Oh, okay, sure. What's the process for how they're written and what's to sort of keep you guys from revoking that exemption that you've written? I'm, I can't hear you, I apologize. What's the process for how the GAMPs are written and what's to keep you from revoking that exception that you've written? Okay, so what the question is, what's the process of, with regard to how GAMPs are written and could this particular provision be rescinded? Um, there are committees that are established w w around each of the GAMPs, and so the site, uh, siting GAMPs would have a committee. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back here, Matt Cap. Can you give me one of these, Matt? He's with Farm Bureau, and he's a member of the siting GAMP, and they have a meeting today at 1 o'clock, so he's going to have to leave early, just giving you that, uh, to go to that meeting. A group of folks involved in the industry, uh, folks from uh, uh, scientists associated with that, get together, review the GAMPs on an annual basis, and then at the end of the year make recommendations to the Commission of Agriculture to make modifications to the GAMPs. So that's how that process happens. It's, a, it's an iterative, iterative process, but uh, in terms of that, could that 100,000 requirement be changed? Sure, I mean, it, that could be changed as part of what, what the Commission of Agriculture might do. The discussion originally was having the number lower, actually, to I think the population that was discussed was 35,000 versus 100,000. So broaden this open, and they thought, start small, see how that goes, and then if it works, then to go to the, the smaller communities. Okay. Yes, ma'am. In, in the camps, uh, the mention of the geese and peacocks interested me um, because they would certainly pull me apart from safety issues, at least with geese, um, is noise issues. To what extent do, in a rural area, you're going to have much, much less concern with noise pollution so the question is with uh, peacocks and other animals that are particularly noisy, how would the local unit of the government handle that? In the case of the 100,000 commu uh, yeah, communities, you would restrict that. I mean, you, the, the city of Detroit's looking at no roosters. That would be the option to do that. I would assume that most communities have a noise ordinance you get into enforcement issues associated with that as well. But, pardon me? What about the city of 60,000? Should they come under the GAMPs? Um, you could, uh, if it's in a residential zoning district, uh, the way, or if it doesn't permit agricultural use, you could restrict it with, uh, uh, you know, the type of animals that you could have on the particular parcels. So that would be possible to do. Okay. Yes, sir. How is the committee membership of the GAMPS committees determined? Um, out of my depth at this particular point, um, I know Matt may know more, to how, how the committees are put together for the, for the GAMPS. But I don't want to put you on the spot, Matt, if you want. Per the Right to Farm Act, um, the, act ha the act has language, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know the exact language, so I'm kind of paraphrasing, that states that it has to be experts, scientists, um, economists. There's several Michigan State University 
faculty members that are on campus committees because they're scientists and they're covered by the Project Management Resources. So if they're, so the minority amp, for instance, is gonna have animal scientists from Michigan State University. The pesticide camp has crop and soil scientists from Michigan State University. So pretty much like industry experts. There, there's a lot of PhD faculty, university, on, on, on the camp committees. Yes. Where does the, where does the stakeholder input come in? Are the stakeholders consulted as part of the GAMP committee, or is that just because they're allowed to give testimony to the Ag Commission? So the question is, where do the stakeholder groups? I'll moderate here a little bit, so if that the, works. That's a good point. Um, also, uh, um, per the Act, for instance, the Act says that um, representatives of local government need to be on the site selection gap. So the Michigan Townships Association has a spot on the site selection gap. The Michigan Association of Counties has a spot on the site selection gap. The environmental community, such as the Michigan Environmental Council, they also serve on GAMP committees. Um, so, so stakeholders are also on the GAMP committees as well. And there's also uh, you know, public remark sections on the Commission of Agriculture agenda, which is an opportunity as well. written comment if you yeah. Should. yeah sure moving on I, and I, I apologize for asking you to speak louder I, I'm wearing hearing aids uh, I just got them I don't know if any of you had that experience but I it was a uh, this is a joke so hang in there with me but I went to the to get the hearing aids I said what kind do you have and they said well they have this kind that's got six settings and you plug an iPod into it and I said how much are they They said we're six thousand dollars an ear I said it's a little too pricey for me you got anything cheaper and they said we have this this one that's only has two settings no iPod it should work fine how much two thousand dollars an ear uh, still still too much what else do you have and he said well we have you look like and sound like the kind of guy who would like our economy model how much dollar ninety five I said what do you get for that well you get a it's a shirt button and uh, we've taken it off the shirt and it has a piece of white string on it he says well how will that help me hear better and said well you stick the white button in your ear and run the string down to your pocket and people talk louder at you <laughs> so I, I I got the two setting model actually so anyway sorry I like to tell stories occasionally here but uh, the other thing that the department deals with moving on past right to farming I know there's other speakers on that but uh, uh, we also deal with uh, uh, food safety, our term for it is uh, farm to fork. So to make sure that the food that people are eating is safe. This will get us into the cottage, cottage food laws here relatively quickly. Um, so we do on-farm uh, reviews, processing, retail, transportation, all those sorts of things that would be associated with uh, uh, making sure the food is safe. We get uh, people that are processing involved in training, inspection of those things. And then we do, we have a lab that's associated with the department that does the lab testing for a whole variety of things, uh, uh, amazing things. I didn't know they were testing seeds, but they test actually seeds, so that's a pretty, pretty neat thing. Cottage food law was passed in 2010. Uh, change is the Michigan food law of 2000, Public Act 92 as amended. This allows folks to make things in their own kitchen. I'm gonna summarize the next few slides here real quickly, but you make it in your kitchen and you sell it to another person uh, in a labeled jar face to face. And it, it has kind of a the sort of startup thing that I'll kind of share you, with you a story about that. They're exempt from licensing and evaluation provisions. So if you're doing this in your kitchen, you don't have to have a stainless steel sink and all the things that you might have in a commercial kitchen with the cottage food law. You can use your facility that you have. Let's see here. Yep, we'll do this. And we'll do that. There we go. Uh, so cottage food products, that's an example of one with a label on it. Uh, it means a food that's not potentially added, so potentially, uh, uh, and, and it, which is a term defined by the food code. Um, these are examples of some cottage foods that somebody might be selling, had the experience of going to a farmer's market in Okemos not too long ago, which they were having in the mall because it was too cold outside, which was kind of a, kind of a cool thing. But, and there was someone selling cottage foods there. They make a neat story because they were a young couple, 
have their baby in the carrier there, and they're, they're, they're uh, selling the food. It's labeled properly. And I said, how much land do you have? Well, we have two acres. And so they're, they're selling their baked, baked goods as well as other, other things and selling that. They said, but we're looking to buy a 17-acre parcel to, so we can expand our cottage food operation and perhaps get into some commercial production. So that was kind of a, a success story and what was hoped to come out of the cottage food uh, law, as a matter of fact. So you have to sell it direct. So the people selling it were the ones who were making it this, at this uh, farmer's market. And uh, so you can't do it at retail outlets, somebody else selling it. You basically, no one else can sell this product other than the people who make it, okay? Makes sense to me. Um, so under, you know, it's not something you could sell to a restaurant, it has to be approved source for those, um, accepted by regulatory authority. Uh, home kitchen, so you bake it in your, you make it in your kitchen, unlicensed, not inspected by regulatory authority, so that is part of that. Labeling, I, I happened to check the labels on <laughs> these folks' stuff that I was buying, make sure it had all of these things. Has the common or usual name of the food, what is it? Name and address of the responsible party. Not that you would get sick and have to call them, but if you did, you could do that. The contents, list of ingredients, and then any allergy, oh, this has peanuts in it, uh, if you have an allergy to peanuts, that sort of thing. And that's basically what it says, relatively straightforward. I think the things I bought in the farmer's market were in mason jars that had the labels on it, so it worked out pretty well. So made in the kitchen, operators need to meet local zoning laws. So does your zoning code, allow you to do the stuff in your kitchen that you're selling then, that you're selling somewhere, and there's a place you're selling it allowed by zoning as well. You, are you put, taking it out on your, your front step and say, I'm selling this, and your local zoning doesn't allow you to do a, uh, that type of vending, then you need to find a place to do that. The other thing which was interesting is that, and this was just apparently increased to $15,000. If you sell more than $15,000 annually using cottage foods, you're no longer a cottage food producer. I think it was 10,000 at one point, but now it's 15,000. So, relatively interesting law. Any questions on cottage foods? Yes, sir. Does your department treat uh, lower risk foods like baked goods differently than higher risk foods like raw milk or wild game? Uh, under the cottage food law or in general? Uh, no, they don't treat them any differently. They're all inspected. Um, I, you know, I'm maybe getting out of my depth here again, but. A lot of meat inspections done by USDA rather than the state of Michigan, but other things are inspected by the state. Uh, we get involved actually in international shipping of uh, products. For example, we ship a lot of apples. I don't know if we'll do that this year, but a lot of apples to Mexico, and they're inspected by our department before they before they go out. That sort of thing. I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. So if you have questions, there's a place, uh, go to our website and get those answered for you and you can direct them. There's another access point in terms of a phone number if you have questions about the cottage food law. Our, we think our website's relatively easy to access but then we're, the only, we're using it all the time so it seems easy to us but so anyway. Any other questions about that before we move on real quickly here? How are we doing time wise? Uh, just consumer protection, this is a real quick thing. We have a weights and measures division that is in the Department of Ag, and so uh, we probably, relative to urban agriculture, we check weights for scales. So if somebody's measuring something, uh, this number of pounds of whatever, those are scales that would be checked by the Department of Agriculture. Um, we all do, also do gas pumps, so if you have a problem with somebody, I'm not getting the gas I, was in, I thought I was gonna be getting here you would contact our department as well. So checking scales, we check scanners in supermarkets, and we even check to make sure the content in a package in a grocery store, and we don't do every package, but it's okay, gee, Kellogg's is selling us this package that has 16 ounces of something and it really only has 14. So that does get checked as well. Moving on. So agricultural expansion opportunities, so that's another other area of the department. Um, so, you know, because we have so many commodities within the state, uh, over 125, I think, is the number, if not more at this particular point, that are different agricultural things that are produced, there's an opportunity for that to be processed and something to be done with it and for it to be sold. Oftentimes, the processing is happening elsewhere. 
And so there's an effort, concerted effort on the part of the department and a part of Michigan State University, frankly, to have processing within the state for some of those commodities that are being pr produced. There's a group called the uh, MSU Product Center that helps farmers to uh, enter into that processing uh, place uh, and to get to, to, to start, uh, you know, venture capital. They look at that as a potential and uh, developing business plans. So you get the venture capital so that you can eventually, eventually do the, um, the operation to do the processing. And so uh, that product center does quite a bit. Uh, good folks to interact with if you have an interest in that sort of thing. And then a good foods charter was developed here recently uh, that talks about the, the interface between locally grown foods and, and making that an objective on the part of, uh, uh, in this case, the, our department has embraced this, making local food available to local, uh, local folks. I think in the study it said 53% of the folks in, uh, uh, within the state of Michigan don't get enough of the foods that are grown within uh, within the state, basically, that are fresh fruits and vegetables. So, re really um, great study. Um, just some trends that are going on in terms of farm fam uh, size of farms within the state. 2002 census. So every five years, there's an agricultural census that occurs in the state. Um, the agricultural census uh, for 2002, uh, small farms, one to nine acre. And you just look over 2007, uh, it jumped up a bit, uh, 10 to 49 acres, that jumped up a bit as well. So we're getting a spread in terms of acres within the state. Uh, small scale farming operations is increasing significantly in our opinion. And then the larger scale operations um, uh, are kind of averaging out or staying the same within the, within, the, uh, within the state. So that's an indication to us that there's a need for this type of, uh, these types of operations. I think the numbers I heard for the city of Detroit uh, in terms of how many agricultural operations there are. For two different numbers, one was 1,200, the other was 1,600 folks doing something here. Had a, a, an opportunity to tour uh, a facility, a, a group of folks. It's interesting, the objectives of folks, I think our, our first speaker was talking about why, do people, why are people doing this? Uh, went into a subdivision located in the northeast part of the, the city. A whole bunch of urban gardens being done. Uh, and it was, um, I don't know if they were leasing the lots or not here, but a whole bunch of folks were there were growing crops on land that was owned by the city of Detroit. And they would talk to neighbors and ask them what they wanted on the adjacent properties. What do you want here? So we took a, they had a path where you could walk through all these, a huge area, up to an area where a woman had a daycare center. She wanted to have a garden where the kids could interact with the garden. And she was out there with these kids, the three to four year olds in the garden. So interesting approach to utilizing the land. Some of it's, as indicated, food, uh, you know, food issues, but also just providing some safe place for people to be. So agricultural opportunities that are going on in various urban settings, uh, hydroponics, um, aquaculture, aquaponics. Uh, in Chicago, a huge aquaponics demonstration project going on in that particular location. Forestry, so one of the issues you might get into if you test the soils and you find that it's got a high lead content and you don't want to grow food that people are going to eat or there's something in the soil, grow trees. That's, that's what's happening on the, Hans Farms was mentioning, mentioned earlier, they've got a three acre test plot that they're growing oak trees on. Cleans a lot up, place to grow trees. You're not going to get any money out of them for about 60 years, but that's one thing that's uh, happening in that particular location. Made a major improvement to that particular neighborhood, frankly. Um, so poultry, specialty crops, rabbits, and bees and honey. So those are all things that folks are talking about doing in these particular areas. Uh, food hubs, so development of food hubs. Eastern Market is recognized as a food hub. So it's a place that can aggregate uh, some of these commodities. I was reading in the Wall Street Journal not too long ago about the uh, Whole Foods. So groundbreaking on Whole Foods recently, was that? I don't know if you guys, a few weeks ago. Part of the reason, in, at least according to the Wall Street Journal, that they came here is because there are so many people producing uh, fruits, and, or fruits and vegetables, basically, in the city of Detroit that they feel that there's a significant source for that within the city that they can then utilize as their fresh produce within the store. 
seem pretty interesting. Groundbreaking today, Myers up on the, uh, uh, the former fairgrounds property. So kind of an interesting approach. So anyway, food hubs being developed. There's a million dollars that have been proposed in the governor's budget uh, that the department would use to encourage other food hubs within the state of Michigan in various locations. So just in that budget will likely be approved at the end of May. We hope that this million dollars remains within that, within that budget. Um, so some of the agricultural opportunities, exporting, uh, we're increasing our exporting quite a bit from the state, a whole bunch of different commodities going out. Um, I had commissioned a mission to uh, China. Uh, conversation was uh, in China, we could take every blueberry that you produce in Michigan. Okay, kind of fascinating. Uh, and then marketing and local markets, these are all places where, where uh, food is being encouraged by our department to be moved. So this is basically the end of the slide presentation. These are some credits for some of the things that Brad had put in his slide presentation. Do you have any other questions for me at this particular point? Do you want to hear another bad joke? <laughs> I guess not. Okay. No one's raising their hand. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. <laughs>